Hello everyone, my name is the Reverend Charlotte Cheshire and I'm here to offer you some training on how to deal with asthma and breathing conditions in church and how to make our churches more accessible for those who suffer from asthma. Now, for those who attended the original training, you will see that there are some differences here. That's simply because, unfortunately, due to a quirk of Zoom, the day on which I delivered the training initially, the recording for that disappeared into the ether. So my apologies for the delay on being able to re-offer this and therefore being able to upload it for you to use. But we have had quite a number of questions and requests for it to be uploaded. So this is my attempt to re-record round two. So for any differences, you see my apologies. So for those who were there on the day, we started off with a little bit of a quiz, just wondering for those who were in the virtual room, what participants already knew about asthma already, and if they could say how common asthma is in the UK, whether or not they thought it's either serious or life-threatening, and whether or not they thought it's a disability. So I'm just going to pause the recording there for a couple of seconds. You will see the questions on the screen, and I'd like to invite you to consider that either on your own where you are, or if you are watching this in a group, to have a little conversation about that now. Okay, I hope that was an interesting conversation that you were able to have, and now we will carry on. The first thing I need to do, ironically enough, is to offer you a few health warnings. And those are that nothing in this training should ever replace any advice that is given to you or to an asthma sufferer by a qualified medical professional. I suffer from asthma, but I'm not medically trained. And equally, if you are having a conversation in your groups, wherever you're watching this, please do just be careful about not sharing other people's confidential health information if you have encountered experiences of people dealing with asthma, because, you know, some people don't necessarily want that to be shared. So this session was intended originally to be recorded, but as I said in the beginning, the original one disappeared into the ether. So this is an attempt at round two. So next, a little bit of information about me. Yes, that is a picture of me on my less healthy days. I am an ordained priest in the Diocese of Litchfield. I'm currently ministering as a secondary school chaplain. And I am also a severe brittle asthmatic. And I am also mother to a child who is moderately asthmatic. So that's where my knowledge and experience of this health condition comes from. So the next thing that I'm going to do is show a video that just gives a bit of an introductory explanation to what asthma is and what asthma actually does to the lungs when a sufferer is experiencing a flare-up. So we'll just take a minute to watch that video now. Hello. In this health sketch, we'd like to talk to you about asthma, a common condition that affects the airways and causes episodes of breathing difficulty. Asthma affects around 5% of the global population, and it is becoming more common worldwide. It often begins in childhood, but also affects adults. 
We don't fully understand what causes asthma, but it seems that both genetics and the surrounding environment are involved. But what exactly is asthma? Asthma affects the airways, the small tubes which transport air in and out of the lungs. Asthma occurs when the airways are more sensitive to certain triggers, so that from time to time they become narrow, inflamed and swollen, and more sticky mucus is produced. All of these changes reduce the flow of air, which leads to some or all of the following symptoms – coughing, breathlessness, tightness across the chest, and wheezing, which is a whistling noise when breathing. Depending on the severity, these symptoms might occur every day or only on occasion. A sudden worsening of symptoms is called an asthma attack, and this can even be fatal if not promptly treated. This is why it's important to see a doctor if you think you might have asthma. Some other conditions may also cause similar breathing problems, but a doctor will be able to diagnose asthma based on your history of symptoms and through breathing tests, which are used to support diagnosis, determine severity, and monitor treatment response over time. Inhalers are the main treatment for asthma, as they deliver medication directly to your airways, helping them to expand. There are two main types of inhalers, preventer inhalers, which you take every day to help prevent symptoms from occurring over the long term, and reliever inhalers, which you use to immediately relieve symptoms as and when needed. Combination inhalers combine both types. A nurse or doctor can show you the right inhaler technique, which is important to make sure the medicine actually reaches the airways. They can also help you decide which type of inhaler device will work best for you. Apart from inhalers, another key step is to avoid the things that trigger your symptoms. These will vary from person to person, but might include cold weather, cigarette smoke, pollution, pollen, dust and mold, animal fur, chemicals and fumes, stress and anxiety, strenuous exercise, and infections like common colds or flu. Some of these triggers are unavoidable, which is why you should always carry a reliever inhaler with you. It's also important to monitor your symptoms over time. If you notice that symptoms are happening more frequently, arrange to see your doctor at the earliest opportunity, as you may need to be stepped up onto higher doses or other medications, including oral tablets. Also, remember that if an asthma attack gets worse and your inhaler doesn't seem to be helping, you must seek immediate medical attention, as stronger medications may need to be given in hospital. While there is no cure for asthma, treatment is usually very effective for controlling symptoms. These symptoms may lessen over time or even disappear for long periods, particularly in people with mild asthma, while in others, symptoms will be more severe and long-lasting. But in all cases, simple steps can make a big difference, such as stopping smoking, identifying and avoiding possible triggers, keeping fit and healthy, taking medication correctly and as prescribed, and keeping a reliever inhaler with you at all times, getting a flu vaccine every year, keeping track of symptoms, and having regular asthma checkups with a nurse or doctor. Through these steps, most people with asthma will be able to manage their condition and lead normal and healthy lives. In this health sketch, we've talked about the common breathing condition, asthma. We've described what happens to the airways, the triggers that bring it on, how it is diagnosed and treated, and how you can stay on top of it. We hope this health sketch has been useful for you and those around you. Health Sketch. Health for all to see. Okay, so moving on now to the symptoms of asthma. There are many. An asthma sufferer may not necessarily experience all of these at the same time, although others will do so. A key symptom of asthma is coughing, and this will frequently sound like a very deep, hacking, bronchial type of cough. An asthma sufferer will frequently also experience wheezing, and if you don't know what that is, that is a whistling sound while they're breathing. They will also experience shortness of breath and a feeling of tightness in their lungs. Some asthmatics might, ex might describe it as feeling like an elephant is sitting on their chest, like there's a weight because their airways are constricted. Asthmatics will frequently also experience a buildup of additional mucus in their airways, 
and this can contribute to that wheezing sound that I mentioned previously. Now, if you don't know, if you are fortunate enough not to know what asthma feels like, I'd like to show you just a little demonstration now of a, a comparison. Just imagine with me that the airways of somebody who does not experience asthma are like that, as in fairly open, fairly clean, fairly wide, like, like a relatively large straw. Now, imagine that the airways of an asthmatic person are like that. Okay, not turquoise, but you know, you can see the difference in the narrowing of them. And then imagine that that is also clogged with mucus. Now, just by way of comparison, imagine trying to breathe through something the width of this, and then trying to breathe through something the width of that. Because basically, asthma is an inflammation or a swelling in the lungs and the airways that makes it more difficult to get air into the lungs to circulate around the body. Okay, there are many, many different triggers for asthma and for asthma attacks. And every asthmatic will be different. Some will be affected by all of these on the list, some only a few of them, or any combination. These are just examples. Some asthmatics will be triggered by either seasonal or food allergies. That could be things like pollens or that kind of thing. Think about the flowers that you might have roundabouts in your garden or your home or your church. Some asthmatics won't be necessarily bothered by pollens, but they will be triggered by things like viruses and illnesses. So imagine that for a non-asthma sufferer, they might have a cold and they might feel pretty crappy for a few days, but then they recover. But an asthmatic who is triggered by colds and viruses will have that cold, but then because their lungs will be triggered, they will end up becoming very seriously ill as a result. Some asthmatics will be triggered by exercise. Now, that's not necessarily the type of exercise that involves running around on a rugby pitch for an hour. It, depending on the severity of the asthma and their relative physical fitness, that exercise could be as simple as, say, if your church is on a hill, walking up the hill to get to the front doors of your church. It could be if, say, they're coming up for communion, someone who might be sitting towards the back of the church has to walk towards the front of the church. That's exercise because it puts a stress on the physical system. Speaking of which, some asthmatics are triggered and worsened by stress. Many of us will be familiar with the fact that many of us have a weak point somewhere in our body. And if we're feeling unduly stressed, then we're triggered by that. So, for example, some people, if they're stressed, might start feeling pain in their neck or pain in their back. For an asthmatic, they are much more likely to experience stress as a flare up in their breathing conditions. Other asthmatics will be triggered by fatigue if they haven't slept well, if they're overtired, either for a short or long period of time. That means that their system is under more pressure, they're more tired. And so, again, their asthma can be flared up. Many asthmatics will be triggered by mold, and that is a big one that we've heard about an awful lot in the news lately with the issues of those who are in public housing who have been affected by black mold. But that's also something that's relevant to consider in our churches, because frequently when we're worshipping in these old buildings, mold is very much a factor. Many asthmatics will be triggered by perfumes and scents. This can be anything from a perfume someone wears. It can be an air freshener that you might have in the bathrooms. It can be a scented candle. It can be the scent of the flowers. Any type of scent in the atmosphere can trigger the airways of an asthmatic. Another big one is smoke. So many asthmatics are triggered by things like cigarette smoke, by incense, by bonfires. And all of those can be relevant in and around our churches. Because for example, even though our churches are non-smoking places, let's be honest, many people go for a smoke just outside the doors of the churches, and then the smoke blows in through the doors. That can be enough to trigger some asthmatics. 
those of us who have a more formal type of worship in our churches and frequently use incense in them, that can be a real trigger for asthmatics. And you'll often hear people say, oh, if you use incense, I'm going to start coughing. Well, that's something to be aware of. Bonfires might be a little bit less frequent in our churches, thankfully. But at the same time, there are certain times of the year when we do use things like this. Uh, just imagine those churches that might light an Easter fire on Holy Saturday. Well, that's the equivalent of a bonfire. Other asthmatics will be triggered by dust. So as hard as it is, if our churches aren't thoroughly cleaned in every corner, that can very much be a trigger for asthmatics. Okay. Looking now at the different types of asthma, there are different categories. Although asthma is very, very common, not everybody suffers it to the same degree. So people who are diagnosed as having mild asthma will experience symptoms around about twice a week, but it's well and easily controlled by the medication that they carry with them. People who are diagnosed with moderate asthma will have symptoms every day, but usually only once per day. And again, that's usually relatively easily controlled. However, those people who are diagnosed as having severe asthma have symptoms every day, multiple times a day, and their preventing medication doesn't necessarily stop or control it. And then those who experience brittle asthma this is a rare form of severe asthma where episodes are severe and they're life threatening despite medication. And it is possible to be classed as being both a severe brittle asthmatic, having those two diagnoses in common. The one that is less commonly known is that some asthmatics experience something called silent asthma. And what that means is that they experience asthma attacks but they don't necessarily have the usual audible symptoms that many of us have come to recognize. So for example, someone who has silent asthma might just start to cough and people could mistake that for, well, they've just got a cough, they've just got a cold, but actually that's a symptom of an asthma attack. And it's not until they start having their medication to open their airways that then you start seeing and hearing how restricted their airways were and that inflammation loosening off. And sometimes then you can only hear the wheezing. So that's one that's particular to be aware of. Okay, common question is, is asthma actually serious? Yes, is the answer. Asthma is very, very common. Many people suffer from it in the UK, but it's really important that we don't dismiss it because in the last decade, there has been a 25% increase in asthma deaths in England and Wales. And in 2017, 1,320 people died of asthma attacks in England and Wales. And in America, on average, 11 people die of asthma attacks every single day. That's a pretty sobering statistic. But many asthmatics will dismiss how serious it is, me included, because when you have a long-term health condition, it can be easy just to adjust to it, to get used to it, and then to downplay it. But it's really important to know that asthma attacks are an emergency and they must be treated as such. Now looking at a little bit of theological reflection in the Bible. In the notes that will accompany this training, you will see lots of different Bible verses that if you choose to, you can take away and reflect on. I'm not going to read all of them here, otherwise it's just going to be ridiculously long. But overall, in the Bible, there are 81 mentions of breath in the Bible. 71 of those are in the Old Testament and 10 of those are in the New Testament. References to the breath of life mostly at the beginning of life and at the end. 
breath is present at that very start of life and indeed at the start of our scriptures because it's one of the first gifts that's given to us by the creator when in Genesis it says that the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and then the man became a living being. And then on the opposite end of things, there are many references that when breath is taken away, we die. So, for example, a reference in the story about Noah's Ark, where it's talking about what's going to happen with the flood of waters on the earth. And it says, for my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life and everything on earth shall die. You can also look at references in the New Testament, particularly relevant at this season of the church year, because just after Jesus has died and been resurrected and starts reappearing to his followers, the part where Jesus gives the gift of the Holy Spirit, it says, Jesus breathes on his disciples with the gift of the Spirit. Particularly in John chapter 20, it says, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is gifted through the gift of breath. A couple of other things to be aware of for those who might have any familiarity with the Hebrew language. Some of the original words, one of them being nefesh, which is translated as soul, means to be an animate, breathing, conscious and living being. And then there is one that you might be a bit more familiar with because sometimes it's referenced in church, the word ruach, which is translated spirit. And it means wind, breath, air or spirit. So in other words, breath is integral to our life and our faith. Now, having said all of this, what can you actually do to help make your church more accessible for those who experience asthma and breathing conditions? Here are a couple of simple suggestions that you can look at. First of all, do a breathing audit in your church. Now, what I mean is go around your church and look for some of the examples that I've mentioned. Smell your church. So look for anywhere where there might be a buildup of dust or cobwebs. Look for anywhere in your church that there might be either the visible appearance or smell of mold. Consider whether or not as part of your worship you might use incense. Consider, too, whether or not you might be able to improve the ventilation in your church. Is there anywhere that you can open a window just for some moving air? Is it possible to open either a door or a window to improve the airflow around the building? And a very common complaint if you do this is that some members of your church will start talking about feeling cold. I am not in any way unsympathetic to that, but please remember some of the lessons that we learned at the height of the COVID pandemic, that air circulation is more important than staying warm. Because it's always possible that you could put on a blanket or a coat or sit on a heated cushion. But if you can't breathe, then you might not necessarily be alive for long. So just, you know, be aware of that. Also look out for what sort of flowers or plants you have in your church. Are they near the ventilation sources that would spread the pollen? Um, as in, are they beside doors and windows? And if so, can they be moved? Are they particularly present around areas that people have to move past? So, for example, if people are coming up to the front for communion, do they have to go past a line of flowers that might trigger them? Or is there an alternative way to look at doing that? Of course, also be aware, as I said before, of particular scents that you have in your church. So if you have, say, air fresheners in your bathroom, consider whether or not these are heavy cloying scents 
or whether or not they are sort of light lemony scents that might be easier for some asthmatics to tolerate. Also consider whether or not there might be anyone in your church that wears particularly heavy perfume or cologne. Now, of course, that's always a matter of personal choice, but it is something to be aware of. And if you're starting to address issues of breathing and ventilation in your church, that might be something to bring up just for people to think about, because many people don't realize. Think also, of course, of whether or not you have smokers in your church. And if you do, where they go to smoke. If they're congregating around the main door at the end of the service, consider finding ways to move them away from the door so that the smoke doesn't come back into the church. And of course, just continue to look at other allergens, food allergens, uh, consider areas of your church that are rarely cleaned, and also consider what sort of cleaning products you use in your church. Because if you use particularly heavily scented cleaning products or strong things like bleaches and that kind of thing, that can also trigger people who have asthma. To quote a very old NHS advert that I will show in just a moment, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. Here's the video now. You may have met a few people who like doing this sort of thing. They're a nuisance, I agree, but pretty harmless. You have certainly seen thousands like this. They're not a nuisance, they're a real danger. Hi, stop it, you! Stop it, stop it! Come here, what do you think you're up to? You've probably infected thousands of people already. What do you think this is for? Yes, that's all right, but here's another way of using your handkerchief. Now sneeze. Come on. All right, never mind. Close your eyes. Now, handkerchief. Sneeze. <coughs> sneeze, handkerchief. <coughs> Got it? Fine. <coughs> Understand? Handkerchief, sneeze. See what I mean? That's the idea. Fine. Now you can carry on. Dangerous bit of work, that. Yeah. That's a darn sight more dangerous. What do you mean? Mean? See him? See that lady? See that couple? See my wife? See me? See this? Let's go on a couple of days. <coughs> See me? See my wife? <coughs> See them? <coughs> See? <coughs> See what you've done? Infected the whole lot of us, and why? <coughs> All because you didn't use your blinking handkerchief. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Perfectly disgraceful, the man ought to be prosecuted. You see, during the time of COVID, we became an awful lot more aware of the perils of having a cough or a cold. And people routinely wore masks, cleansed their hands, or kept distance between one another. Just because the COVID restrictions have finished, that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't do that anymore. So it's a good idea to continue providing face masks to people, alcohol hand gel, to advise that people keep their distance from one another. And if you have a staff or volunteer team and you're aware that people are regularly coming to church, even if they're unwell because of a sense of responsibility, Consider the impact that might have on some of the more vulnerable members of your churches and frankly encourage them to stay home because as important as any of the jobs in our churches are, it's not more important than people being able to breathe. 
Then consider issues in your church around physical accessibility. So consider whether or not you have stairs in your church. Uh, let's say, for example, you have maybe a coffee area upstairs or maybe your loo's are upstairs or your children's area. You know, if people have to climb those stairs or up to the towers, that can be a real issue. Consider also any areas where people might have to do long walks. Let's say, for example, you might have your parking on this side of your church building, but your door is all the way over here. Is there any way that you can have some more accessible parking spaces or even a drop off area for those who would struggle to walk that far? Because that doesn't just apply to elderly people who are becoming a bit frail. It can also apply to people who look relatively young and fit, but may have breathing conditions that are invisible. Consider where you offer your seating areas and whether or not it takes a long time, like a long walk for people to get from the doors to the seating area. Also consider the disclaimers you make at the beginning of your worship. For example, we're starting to learn a little bit more about things like say, not just saying, please stand, but saying, if you are comfortably able to do so, please stand, or whatever feels comfortable for you in worship, you can do. But be aware that this applies to asthmatics as well, because if you're struggling with your breathing, then the strength required to stand and potentially to both stand and speak or stand and sing can make it much harder. Whereas if people can remain seated, they might be more able to participate in the worship. Also be aware that there may be some asthmatics who would be present in the building, but they might not necessarily join in with the said responses or the sung hymns because they just don't have the breath strength to do it. And so if you are having those things like where you might say, and now we all join in together and say, that can leave some asthmatics feeling excluded. So they're different. But finally, also consider that blue badges, those disabled badges to be able to use the disabled parking spaces can be given to people who have severe breathing conditions. So if you see someone like me who parks in a blue badge space, displays a blue badge and then climbs out of their car looking as though they're able-bodied, don't dismiss the fact that there will be a good reason why they have that blue batch. Okay, so now consider some emergency asthma protocols that we need to have in church. So for example, we would be used to the idea that a first aider needs to be able to deal with someone who has fallen over and cut themselves or bumped themselves. But our church first aiders also need to be trained in dealing with asthma. So some of the background to this can be, they need to be able to recognize what a blue reliever inhaler looks like. This will be labeled as something like either Ventolin or Salbutamol, which are the most, Salbutamol is the generic medication name for it. Ventolin is the most common uh, branded name, but there are others. The key thing is that it's blue. Ideally, the asthmatic will also have a spacer with them. This is either a long bubble or a long rectangular tube. And basically you put the inhaler in one end and then you breathe in the other end because it means you don't have to breathe in quite as deeply or as sharply to get the medication deep into your lungs. If you have asthmatics in your church, please do be aware that many of them, me included, will downplay their symptoms and they will resist getting help. Oh, I'm fine, I'll be okay. But please know that asthma is an emergency. So if somebody is having an asthma attack, and by this I mean one of those severe ones where they're really, really struggling, the first most important thing to do is to keep calm. Reassure the person, speak slowly and calmly and clearly. Because even those who don't have breathing conditions will be aware that if we start to panic and we get more anxious, our breathing gets more shallow. So for someone who is already experiencing a reduction in their breathing, 
if those around them are very anxious and speaking quickly, it will only increase their own anxiety and make it even harder to breathe. So keep calm. Then you should encourage the person with asthma to sit up and to sit slightly forward. The reason for this is that it helps to open up the airways because if we're sitting crunched down like this, then we're putting pressure on our lungs. But if we're sitting like this, and you can experiment with this in the same way as singers will be trained to do, open your lungs. So encourage someone who is experiencing asthma to do that. Most importantly, remain with an asthmatic. Do not leave them alone because the situation can worsen rapidly. If you need to go and get an inhaler for them, if at all possible, send someone else and you stay with them. I mean, hopefully it would be in the bag that the person has with them. But if by chance you might have an emergency inhaler in your church, just send someone else and make sure that someone stays with them. Okay, so the next thing to do is always help. Watch, or if needs be help, the person take two puffs of their inhaler, ideally through that spacer. What they need to do is to shake the inhaler because that mixes the medication with the propellant. Then they need to take one puff and count to 10 slowly while they're breathing in. Ideally, they shouldn't be panting. Equally ideally, it's a bad habit of many asthmatics, they shouldn't take multiple puffs at the same time. One puff, breathe, count to 10, shake, and then a second puff, breathe and count to 10. If there is no improvement in their symptoms, then they should continue to take two puffs every two minutes, but they should take an absolute maximum of 10 puffs before calling for help. If the person does not feel significantly better after 10 puffs of their inhaler, then you need to ring treble nine. But equally, if you're worried about them at any point, even before they've had 10 puffs, don't hesitate to ring treble nine, don't wait, because asthma is and can be a life-threatening emergency and asthmatics can go downhill very, very quickly. The next thing is keep going. If you're waiting longer than 10 minutes for an ambulance, which as we all know at the moment, we probably will be, keep giving the person another 10 puffs in the same way, but only if you've already called for help because Ventolin increases the heart rate. So medical supervision is needed to prevent you having too much. It's also important to say, don't hesitate. Even in the midst of all of these protocols, don't hesitate to call an ambulance immediately. If the person appears to be exhausted or feeling faint, because that's a sign of oxygen deprivation, if they have either a blue or white tinge around their lips or even around their fingernails, because again, that's a sign of not having enough oxygen in the system. Obviously, if their skin itself is going blue or if they've collapsed, just call an ambulance, don't mess around. Okay, finally, don't be frightened because asthma is treatable. The key thing with asthma is prevention. So every small action that we take to make our church safer makes in turn an asthmatic person safer. If you want to explore this more and you'd like more information on asthma, then there is all sorts of information available. Some of the key sites would be Asthma and Lung UK, or the NHS website. You will also see on your PowerPoint that if you're interested, there is an asthma quiz available online that can help you refresh this knowledge and see how much you've managed to retain. And of course, you're always welcome to share this video on the condition you remember that I am an asthma sufferer, but I'm not an asthma professional. So nothing that I say should ever be replaced by anyone who is actually medically trained. Okay, I hope this has been helpful to give you some resources, some opportunity to discuss and to learn a little bit more about how we can help to make our churches safer for those who experience asthma and related breathing conditions.
If you have any other questions, feel free to have a discussion or indeed to follow up with the Enabling All team, and we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can.